Well, thank you very much for coming to listen to me this morning. Uh, this is a very much um, a personal odyssey. I'm going to talk you through um, some of the perhaps broader than barcode. David said barcoding might not be the most gripping after dinner speech. Uh, I'd like to broaden it a little bit just to talk about potentially some of the benefits of technology for clinical practice. And it's a personal odyssey because I, I am still a practicing doctor. I spent all of last week at my hospital, including two days covering the junior doctor strike. So it took me back sort of 30 years to doing things I hadn't done for a very long time. We managed and muddled through, but it would be to diminish our trainees to say we didn't miss them and that they are very skilled people who contribute hugely to the health service. Um, but in that personal odyssey, I've identified a number of times that... Uh, Technology can benefit hugely the practice of medicine if we would only adopt it, of which barcoding is one, one very good example. So I want to start by saying, uh, uh, talking a little bit about patient safety, which is a particular interest of mine. So you might be shocked to learn that of the top 20 risk factors in the United Kingdom for all deaths, uh, adverse in-hospital health care ranks above um, road traffic accidents, alcohol, things that are often in the newspapers as, as common causes of death. But I also want to set that in the context of something. I was very moved by Ashley's speech last night at dinner. There's a denominator as well as a numerator. The numerator is the number of things that go wrong. The denominator is the phenomenal amount of work with the, which the NHS undertakes in a year. So over 600 million prescriptions. So I was prescribing last week during the junior doctor strike. I can tell you, every time you make a prescription, name, hospital number, date of birth, dose, milligrams, micrograms, oral, IV, there's multiple places you can make a mistake. 300 million GP visits, 30 million outpatients, 5 million people admitted, and almost 3 million emergency ambulance calls. So you won't be surprised when people in the NHS are a little bit concerned when constantly parallels are drawn with the aviation industry. There are not 600 million planes taking off and landing at Heathrow each year. I'm not saying it's not a complex industry, and it's not, of course it's safety critical, but every single one of these interactions is uh, open to error. It doesn't have a black box, and it's usually gray. I rarely see patients where I have all the data I would like, and all the time I would like to make that decision. So it's very, very different. But nevertheless, mistakes do happen, avoidable errors, wrong site surgery. Um, and it's estimated that that costs 3 million NHS bed days or a billion a year, perhaps 1% of the money we spend on the NHS. So it's worth doing something about. In about 2004, I, I went on the Cabinet Office uh, leadership program. And during that, you had to either, if you were in the private sector, spend two weeks in the public sector or vice versa. So I elected, I could have gone to Formula Ferrari, Formula One, but I actually chose to go to Shell in Aberdeen. Don't know, I sometimes regret that. <laughs> Aberdeen on a wet Sunday versus, <laughs> versus Ferrari. Anyway, I wanted to go and see another safety critical industry. How do, they, how do they deal? And I was really struck. I arrived at the airport in Aberdeen. I was met by um, a car provided a taxi that Shell had organized. And when we got to the Shell um, Centre, in a completely empty car park, this taxi reversed in. So I asked the taxi driver why he did this. And he said, well, Shell have looked at accidents in the car park, and most happen because people drive in in the morning, and at the end of a long day, when it's dark, reverse out at night and reverse into somebody. So everybody has to reverse in in the morning and drive out forwards at night. Oh, that's interesting. So then I went in, and they said, would you like a cup of coffee? And I said, yes, and I had this cup of coffee. I went around and said, no, no, you can't walk around with hot drinks. If you want to walk around with a hot drink, you have to put a lid on. I said, well, I'm a grown-up. You know, I promise you I won't spill it <laughs> over your nice shell carpet. I said, no, no, you don't understand. If you, if you get used to walking around with hot drinks here, and you go out onto the oil rig, and you slip, and you tip that over somebody, and they're scalded, then we have to bring that person back to Aberdeen and we have to send a helicopter out to get them. Okay, so then we went upstairs to the meeting room and someone, with two steps up the stairs, someone stopped me and said, no, no, you've got to hold the banister. <laughs> so I'm feeling like a four-year-old at this time. 
And I, they said, if you don't hold the banisters here, when you go on that oil rig and you slip and fall, you not only risk your own life, because you're in the North Sea now, and we have to send a helicopter out, and somebody has to be winched down into that sea to bring you up. And all of those people's lives are placed at risk by your, by your one safety incident. So that's a, a way, some anecdotes of demonstrating that Shell had an absolutely profound safety culture that went all through their industry. It was absolutely embedded. And it was described in, in this way as there's two ways of doing everything. There's the Shell way and the wrong way. And that was how they ran it. And I said, how do you enforce this? And they said, well, about 80% of our employees in Aberdeen are not Shell employees. They're on contracts. And we're the single, single biggest employer in Aberdeen. So the first time somebody, say a taxi driver, doesn't reverse in, we give them a verbal warning. The second time, a written warning. And the third time, we suspend the contract and we find another taxi firm. So they said, really, we don't have any trouble <laughs> imposing this at all. <laughs> So I came back from that experience to be a, I was a non-exec director in a big hospital, 1,300 beds, 10,000 staff, 600 million pound turnover. This is the issue we're dealing with, hand washing. Contrast that with Shell. So hand washing, Semmelweis demonstrated about 100, over 100 years ago in Vienna that hand washing saves lives, prevents infections. Here we are with MRSA infections, C. diff infections, and our doctors have, a, on average, a compliance of about 70 to 80% with hand washing. <laughs> Nurses, who I know there are many in the room, always have better compliance than doctors, usually over 90%. Doctors' compliance goes up when you visit or inspect, or you can, have, you can wash your hands with a dye that you then put under ultraviolet light, and you can see whether you've been thorough or not. And if you expose doctors to that, they're quite competitive people. They'll wash their hands properly. And then they relapse. They wear cufflinks, they wear watches, they, they, they insist on doing their own thing. And I just found that quite shocking, that we as doctors were electing to put patients' lives at risk through not hand washing, something that Shell would just not tolerate. So I show you that to contrast what I think is lacking in the NHS, is that absolute attention to a safety culture and our inability to impose or manage that. Clinicians like autonomy, something I'll come back to. Um, okay, so moving on a little bit to technology. I first became interested in, in barcoding, actually. I was, uh, uh, some of you probably might remember baby Abby Humphreys, who was abducted from a hospital in Nottingham, newborn baby, and was abducted for, I think, a couple of weeks before she was found. And I was her pediatrician at the time she was abducted, and of course the parents were distraught. But it was following that that... Uh, um, there was a move, you, you may not remember, prior to 1997, there was no real culture of everybody wearing an identity bracelet and everybody being tracked. And, and following the Abbey Humphreys abduction, and this is sometimes how the NHS and all industries respond, one event led to uh, everyone being electronically tagged and the doors of the intensive care unit, you had to have that electronic uh, if, if you went through it wearing an electronic tag, so if you abducted a baby, the alarm would go off. So that was a, a, a huge technological change spurred by one event. But it then led on subsequently to me being very interested in patient safety. And I w and served on the Committee on Safety of Medicines, which uh, is a body that for the whole of the UK has the responsibility of making sure that our medicines that we use are of high quality, safe and effective. <coughs> But there's barcoding again. So here's three vials of drugs that would appear on many, many resuscitation trolleys. When someone arrests, you've got a few minutes to get it right. They all look remarkably alike. The barcoding is different. The barcoding is what's been brought in to allow stock control and ordering. But they're all clear, colorless solutions. They're all in little plastic vials. They've all got white and yellow labels with black writing on them. It's very, very easy to crack open the wrong one and inject the wrong thing. So barcoding is, a, is an adjunct, but there's much more to patient safety than just barcoding. After I finished my time on the Committee on Safety of Medicines, uh, again, it was a Nottingham incident. Um, a, a young man called Wayne Jowett, not one of my patients, he was on an adult ward, he was 19, had... Uh, 
had a wrong drug injected. It wasn't quite the same as these are all intravenous injections, these three. But Wayne was, had leukaemia and, and required to have a drug called vincristine injected into his spine. And what happened was that the intravenous preparation, which looks the same as the, the intraspinal one or intrathecal one, it's clear, colourless, it comes in a little bottle, it looks just like the other little bottle, and the doctors inadvertently injected uh, intravenous vincristine into his spinal cord, and he died several weeks later uh, as a result of that. What perhaps was most shocking was that that was the 23rd time in the UK NHS that somebody had had intravenous vincristine injected into their spine. It wasn't the first time this had ever happened. And that gave rise to Sir Liam Donaldson coming up with the concept of organisation with a memory, <coughs> that we shouldn't be constantly learning these mistakes over and over again. And he created the National Patient Safety Agency, which was a body I sat on as an advisor for several years. And by that time, barcoding had come in and was starting to be deployed in various parts of the NHS. So most uh, obviously blood transfusion, barcoding has been used extensively for quite some time in matching uh, the donation of blood bags to the patient. And the Abby Humphrey story had moved on from going from simple... Uh, uh, identity bracelets to barcoding so that potentially the patient could be matched to, to drugs, for example. More recently, I've been chair of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges and uh, talking on behalf of 220,000 doctors in the UK on a number of issues. And one of those was a round table convened by the Health Services Journal. And it was around the idea of procurement, which wasn't something... I was particularly uh, knowledgeable about, but it seemed to me again to relate to these issues of using technology to make health service better. And uh, I think I wasn't here yesterday, but I think the opening speech yesterday, and partly echoed by what Ashley said last night, is there's nothing wrong about talking about money. David Cameron's been saying, uh, talking about money this week, that, that wealth isn't a dirty word, but saving money in the health service isn't a dirty word either. I think it was Ashley who said, saving money saves lives. And I'll come back to talk about that in a moment. But at this Health Service Journal round table, um, I was absolutely astonished to, to learn about the, the amount of money that the NHS spends wastefully on procurement. And there were two people at that round table from Marks and Spencers who said, you know, we've got Marks and Spencers retail outfits all over the UK. Do you think we buy different shoes or different uh, clothes for each of those stores? Do you think we let each store go out and procure their own products. No, we have a massive purchasing capacity. We drive down the, the price we pay by having collective bargaining. And I just was amazed at that. I hadn't really been aware until that point. I still thought there was an N in NHS and that we'd had some kind of National Health Service. And Lord Pryor commented that one of the dangers, and I'm not against uh, devolution and subsidiarity, but ultimately you end up with 300 outfits competing and all buying, and they buy a lot. Here's some examples. So the NHS procures 1.7 million different items, and you'll hear from Mandy Sunderland later about the extraordinarily large catalogue the NHS has compared to retail outfits. Um, 61 trusts, so that's 61 hospitals, procured 1,750 different cannulae. Cannulae are those little things we insert in a vein to give drugs or fluids. You maybe need two or three, a yellow one, a blue one, and a green one, 24-gauge, 22-gauge, 20-gauge, maybe one other. Um, one trust bought 177 different types of rubber gloves. It's a sort of fetishism, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> and uh, this round table estimated that maybe two to four billion pounds could be saved just by moving away from these ridiculous procurement... And barcoding is at the heart of that. A catalogue with single identifiers, stock control, you can scan in what you're using and you can reorder. So that led on to, while I was chair of the academy, I was undertaking a, a project to look at, at waste in the health service and we presented this and I was asked to give evidence to the Health Select Committee. And we estimated, we did a number of case studies, probably 30 case studies from around the four nations of the United Kingdom. And again, rather than procurement, we estimated that another two billion could be saved just by what, what David Pryor enunciated, uh, reducing variation. 
So bringing the worst up to the best, or even bringing the bottom quartile up to the median. So if you look at something called the NHS Atlas of Variation, you'll see huge variability across our National Health Service. I'll give you one example. I'm quite interested in children with diabetes. Now, diabetes is a completely uh, treatable condition. Since the 1920s, since Banting and Best discovered insulin, we have a, a treatment. There's really only one reason children ever die of diabetes. There's only one complication. It's called diabetic ketoacidosis, where they go into a coma. So and it's completely avoidable. Across the NHS in England and Wales, there's a seven-fold variation between the best centres for diabetes and the worst. So if anyone in this room had a child with diabetes with a treatment known since 1920 and a, complete, a completely avoidable life-threatening complication, you'd be sitting there wondering, why can it be seven times worse in one place than another? Same doctors, same nurses, we all speak English, it's the same insulin. Extraordinary. So that idea of bringing the, the, the worst even just up to the median would be a huge achievement. And we set out in that publication some examples of using technology, of which barcoding is one example, to reduce variation across the health service. Again, save another two billion. Saving money saves lives, not because I'm trying to save it for George Osborne, but because we can reinvest the money we save by disinvesting in inefficient practices or, or unwarranted practices and reinvesting in things that work. More recently, I've been asked by the MHRA, the Medicines Healthcare Regulatory Agency, which has it's kind of gone full circle. I said this was a personal odyssey. So the Committee of Safety of Medicines, which I started with uh, 15 years ago, is now subsumed within the MHRA. And following the um, PIP breast implant scandal, I was asked by the MHRA to chair a review of the devices side of the industry. So you, would pro you may all know this already because Unfortunately, today is slightly speaking to the converted. You're all here because you probably all sold on this message. But most people would be, I think, surprised to be reminded that many of the 50,000 women who had had breast implants, PIP implants, weren't aware of what they'd had implanted into their body and weren't aware of who they should go back to for redress and weren't aware of, and no one was really aware of how they would tell whether any one individual should have those implants removed. So that, compare that to an industry, I think you heard yesterday about when we have food scandals or when Volkswagen recall cars or, or Toyota with the brakes or the emissions. They can track and trace everything. Here were 50,000 women walking around in the UK with a foreign body, uh, you know, at their, at their choice implanted, but nobody able to track them down and recall them. And that uh, report that I then published and all my recommendations were accepted by the MHRA had as one of its most important recommendations that every single thing in, implanted into a patient should have a unique device identifier. That's almost certainly going to involve some kind of barcoding and scanning, almost certainly. And we could use that with, um, we already have a unique patient identifier, we just don't use it in the NHS. All of us, from the day we're born, have an NHS number. That's been around since 1948. My hospital has hospital numbers. GPs have GP numbers. Why do we not use the NHS number? 65 million people in this country all already have a unique identifier. We link that to the unique device identifier, and you've got a match that you can track and trace. And then you could have one-click reporting. One of the reasons reporting, say, of, of hip failures, hip replacement failures, doesn't happen is all of us are busy people. And when you log on and try to go through the system and report something, it's a nightmare. So you could have the unique device identifier, the problem that's occurred, one click, and you could report it. I mentioned electronic prescribing uh, earlier. I I'm a pediatrician. So on the same day, I prescribed for these two people. One is a, a mother who had been a patient of mine for about 15, 16 years when she became pregnant. She delivered this tiny baby who weighed uh, uh, about a kilo, and I have to prescribe for both of them. So one weighs about 60 kilos and one weighs one kilo, and I've, I've given you some examples of the potential error. Um, the NHS lags way behind many other sectors in using technology to address those kind of problems. Electronic prescribing with computerized decision support or algorithms has been available in general practice for 30 years. 
I went to Baltimore in 2004. Most American hospitals then were using that. Um, the hospital I work in, not my claim, but many people would say it's one of our leading NHS acute hospitals. We've just had computerized electronic prescribing uh, starting in the last few months. And amazingly, we have an electronic prescribing system. We also have an electronic BNF, the British National Formulary, that gives all the drugs and all the doses to be used in the UK. Are the two linked? No. So when I'm prescribing on the electronic prescribing and I can't remember the dose and I want to prescribe something, I have to log out of the electronic prescribing software, go to a different set of software, upload the eBNF, log in with a different username and password, find the drug name and the dose, write it down with a fountain pen on a piece of paper, log back out, log in again, and then transcribe that drug dose back into electronic prescribing. Maybe enough said. I could read to you, I wrote this in the BMJ about Captain Logs, star date, um, just trying to look at an X-ray. Decline several on-screen queries, open a new program, re-enter your username and password, and then be told that the software won't work unless you begin and close the word processing program. This is all rail from a ward round in my hospital. This is, this is the technology we are struggling with. So I hope I've kind of demonstrated to you that there are many, many opportunities in clinical medicine where we can use technology to enhance patient safety. And just if I want to finish by just kind of summarizing, I hope, the points I've made. Um, there's lots of nurses here, probably not so many doctors. Uh, doctors are not Luddites. They like technology. They like embracing new toys. But the trouble is they like it to be their own toy. What they don't like is standardization. They like autonomy. They don't like guidelines. Uh, they don't like stuff like the Atlas of Variation, which exposes variation in practice. So I think one of our challenges for us in GS1 is we have to get clinical leadership on board. We have to have, make sure the demonstrator sites demonstrate proof of principle and then roll that out and make sure that we get the clinical community to adopt this. Secondly, there is proof of principle. There's no point in getting, us up, getting upset with discussions yesterday about money and money being withdrawn if the pilot sites demonstrator sites don't prove proof of principle, don't demonstrate that the, this can be introduced and rolled out across 300 trusts in a cost-effective way, then it won't happen. So we shouldn't be uh, troubled by that. And we should just remind ourselves of those 50,000 women with things implanted in their body that had we got some of this simple technology, barcoding, track and trace, that the ability to recall those people and offer them some redress would have been much more comparable with things like the car industry and, and the food industry, which is what we should aspire to do. So thank you very much. <laughs>